Welcome back! In our last video, we followed the Open Lenia tutorial on Google Colab to convert the Game of Life into a smooth Lenia simulation in Godot. Lenia is a form of digital automata, where instead of binary states like Conway's Game of Life, we get smooth, continuous changes. It was a lot of fun to learn, but we used GDScript in that project, and so it was painfully slow. It was perfect, though, for understanding the logical components and moving parts of a Lenia simulation. If you're not familiar with Lenia Automata or want to know what makes it tick, check out that video. This time, we're going to take that Lenia logic and move it to a GLSL compute shader to greatly improve its performance. And we'll throw in a bunch of bells and whistles to make it more interactive. We'll review the existing shader example from GitHub and rework it to use a multi-panel display. We're also going to add some neat configuration settings for the shader, including different kernels and patterns. These options will let you choose the color and settings that we send to the shader to visualize the life forms with different palettes. And we'll use Godot's custom resources to store those life forms in playfield patterns. Finally, we'll bring it all together with a simple user interface so you can adjust the simulation as it runs in real time. Quick note, like before, this is hobby code, and I don't recommend using it directly in games. It's more of a learning resource for those interested in compute shaders and digital life in Automata. The open source will be available in the Pathfinder's Codex GitHub shortly after this video goes live. It might be there already, so be sure to stop by and check it out. Let's begin. Let's start by reviewing the original compute shader by Ludmuderal. You can find that base code on GitHub. This simplified shader runs using GLSL code and is directly applied to the graphics compute pipeline. It's a great example of how to use a compute shader. The two main components are the GLSL code itself and the GD script that sets up the pipeline and invokes the shader. We'll look at that code in more detail as we go to add new features to it. For now though, simply running that shader as is shows us that it runs so much smoother and faster than the GD script version to the point that it's just not worth trying to improve that GD script. That's what you get when you use a compute shader to process things on the GPU in parallel, instead of being bottlenecked by a CPU when looping over large arrays and grids. The shader is responsible for accepting the input grid as a shader buffer, processing each cell in the buffer, generating the resulting grids as image textures, and then outputting the next grid and all textures back to GD script. This was my first leap into compute shaders, and having existing code that already worked made learning the core concepts much easier. The official Godot documentation on compute shaders was also helpful, and worth a read if you want to know more about setting up buffers, layouts, and uniforms. Let's list out the improvements we want to make to the shader. First, we'll turn it into a four-panel display. The existing shader already has two panels, one for the main grid and one for the kernel. We'll use those two and we'll also add two new grids, the weighted neighbor sums and the resulting growth values. After we finish the four panel display, we'll add push constants to the mix. This is how we'll pass dynamic settings to the shader. This makes the shader more versatile and requires less hard coding settings directly in the GLSL code. We'll set up four push constants for things like the time scale, the growth parameters, and the color scheme. Speaking of color schemes, we're going to add a few of the most common color palettes to the shader. Using one of the new configuration push constants, we'll be able to tell the shader which color scheme to use when it creates pixels. After we get the main parameters and color scheme selector in place, we'll focus on making the kernel size dynamic and introduce the ability for the kernel to have more than one ring in it. It's a little more complicated than passing simple push parameters, but we'll make it work. Finally, we'll finish up by creating a simple control panel. This way we can see and modify all of the parameters on screen. You'll be able to start and stop the simulation, or run it step by step, and inspect the grid values. This is where we'll make the option to select pre-configured play fields, and allow you to adjust different settings that we make into push constants. Let's cover each of those topics one at a time. After reviewing the original shader, I knew immediately that I wanted to change it to use the four panel display from our previous video. To do this, we'll need to make changes both on the Godot side, and within the shader code itself. The basic idea is that we'll use two new data buffers and two new image textures. 
And since we already have existing code for three buffers and an image texture, we can use that same logic to set up the new variables. To implement the new multi-panel display, we started by adding these new variables to manage the extra data buffers and image textures. These new storage buffers will be set up in the rendering device, similar to the ones already in place for the main grid and kernel. Once these buffers are established, we'll also need to configure two new image textures in the rendering device, ensuring that they are bound to the correct IDs. With these elements prepared, we'll create new uniforms, bind them appropriately, and expand the uniform list to include the new buffers. After the shader runs, we'll grab the processed data and set the textures for our new panels. In the GLSL shader, we introduce new layout definitions for the new buffers, ensuring they use the correct binding IDs and follow the style of the existing code. Similarly, we'll define new layouts for the new image textures, again adhering to the established code style. The heart of this change lies in modifying the main processing function. This is where the shader will store the new data into the new buffers and update the pixel data for the new image textures, corresponding to our new panels. When everything is in place and we run the project, we'll see our four panels, and each will show us different aspects of the Lenia simulation. We see the kernel and main grid like before, but now we also get new panels showing us the weighted neighbor sums and the growth values. Looks good. Let's keep going. The original shader hard codes some of the settings that we normally want to change in a Lenia system. Things like the time scaling factor and the growth parameters. So next, we'll modify the project so we can pass parameters directly from Godot into the shader, removing those hard-coded values. To do this, we'll use the concept of push constants. We'll set up the push constant data to pass all of the configurable parameters in a single structure. Then we can use those values in the GLSL code. When the values change in Godot, the new values are passed to the shader automatically. We started by adding and exporting variables that correspond to the parameters in the shader. For example, we'll define the time scaling factor as frequency scale, and introduce the two growth parameters, one for the center and one for the width. Additionally, we'll create a property to handle the selected color scheme, which we'll pass into the shader in the next section. All of these values will be packed into an array of floats and injected into the compute pipeline to ensure the shader can process them efficiently. On the shader side, we added a new push constant uniform to receive the incoming parameters. We modified the main processing function to use these new push constants for the frequency scale and the growth center and width values. OK, with the push constants ready to go, now we can change the values directly in the GD script if we ever need to try different time scales or growth parameters. Not very interesting yet, because it still requires us to change settings in the code. A little later in the video, we'll hook up these GD script variables to some input controls, so we can adjust them without having to change the code by hand. On to the next part, where we're going to add a dash of color to our world, using one of these push constants. Grayscale is effective for storing pixel values for each point in our linear grid, but it's kind of boring. So let's add a feature where we can control the color scheme of the main grid display panel. We'll use one of our push constants from earlier to pass the selected color scheme to the shader. We added a system to manage color palettes for the main grid display. In Godot, we'll store the selected palette as an integer, simplifying how it passes into the push constants. We'll define five possible color schemes, ranging from grayscale to the more visually striking options like jet and plasma. While this change only impacts the main panel, it could easily be adapted for the other panels if desired. In the shader code, we use the fourth parameter of the push constants to handle the color scheme selection. We'll add functions that define the color transformations for the new palettes, in addition to the original grayscale. Then, in the main processing function, we'll convert grid values to the correct pixel colors based on the currently selected scheme. The coloring only affects the image texture pixels in the shader, not the actual buffer values. Those have to remain in their original form so the actual simulation works as expected. And now, when we run the shader, it'll take the selected color scheme number and use that to change the color of the pixels in the main grid. And because it's a push constant, if the simulation is running and we change the GD script code to a different color scheme, we'll immediately display our new updated colors in the main grid. Changing the color selection still requires a manual change in the code, though. We'll fix that when we get to the user interface later in the video. 
The original shader used a static kernel size and only supported a single ring in the kernel. Let's extend that so we can set the kernel to whatever size we want and also allow for the kernel to contain more than one ring. That way we'll be able to play with some of the more advanced lifeforms. First, we introduced new variables in Godot for setting the kernel size and also to define multiple ring amplitudes. We'll make the kernel radius variable dynamic. But because the kernel buffer is passed to the shader only during startup, we need to make sure we update the compute pipeline anytime the radius changes. That's what we're using this setter for. When the kernel changes, in addition to actually setting the new size, we need to rebuild the kernel bytes and also reapply the buffer and uniform back into the pipeline. Luckily, we can reuse a lot of code from the original pipeline logic to do this. So we'll do that and recreate buffer 3 and also uniform 3 and then update the uniform set in the pipeline. To handle multiple rings in the kernel, we'll use a list of amplitudes. That way we can configure the rings with a specific format that's easy to store and share. The number of values in this array tells us how many rings we'll have. So a single value of 1 will be the normal kernel we've been using. The values in the array tell us the amplitude of each ring, starting from the innermost ring and working our way out. Now we just need to update the create kernel function so it uses our new amplitudes array. When it's generating the bell-shaped rings in the kernel, we'll calculate the intervals between the rings and we'll calculate the unique bell curve based on the amplitude for each ring. The rest of this function remains the same and simply returns the bytes array of the kernel, so we're good to go here. We can now experiment with kernels of different sizes and complexity, unlocking the ability to create more complex lifeforms and patterns. There aren't any changes to the GLSL code to make the larger multi-ring kernel work. It still works with a single kernel regardless of how many rings it has. Okay, let's finally add some user input to make this more interactive. Using control nodes, we'll get real-time control of the sim without having to change the code by hand. Great for quickly experimenting with new ideas and patterns. We've already set up the configurable push constant variables in the previous segments, including the dynamic kernel parameters. So now we just need to connect all of those parameters to elements on the screen. First, we'll add some buttons to start, stop, and restart the simulation using a simple state machine. This will also let us step through the sim tick by tick. Then we'll hook up some sliders and connect them to our push constants, so we can see the effects as we move the sliders in real time. We'll be able to speed up and slow down the sim and adjust the growth parameters with these sliders. We'll also add some drop downs, one for the color picker to pass the selected color scheme to our shader, and one to choose which lifeform play field we want to load up into the simulation. We'll use custom resources for the play fields, which we'll see in a moment. The user interface will have buttons to start, stop, and step through the simulation. We'll also have the ability to restart the sim. We'll add a basic state machine to help with this logic. Nothing fancy, just a simple enumeration and a variable to hold the current state. Then we'll use this value in our pipeline process function to determine if the shader should be running or stepping. And we'll use one of the states to preview the next grid without actually making a buffer swap. In the main UI script, we'll create some helper functions that will let us adjust the state in the pipeline. Then, using the built-in pressed signal on the buttons, we'll hook up those helper functions. And now we can start and pause the sim, restart it, and step through it step by step if we wanted to. Next, we'll create some sliders and connect them to our push constants, enabling real-time adjustments to growth settings and timescaling without altering code manually. We'll connect their signals to the main UI script to send the slider values to our push constants. We'll use the built-in value change signal for this. We'll also add an extra signal for the UI labels to be updated anytime the values change in Godot. We connect to that signal here. This helper function is used to update the labels in the UI and also initialize the sliders if the underlying values have changed. And now we can change things in real time, like the growth settings and the time scale while the simulation is running and even preview it while it's paused. Now let's add some option controls. Like the sliders, we'll connect some built-in signals to the main script. This time we're connecting to the item selected signals. The color selection will be sent to our compute shader using one of our push constants here. The play fields, however, are stored in a custom resource class called Lenia Playfield. To make loading playfields easier and to keep things more separate, 
the UI simply assigns the play field as an integer, based on the option you select in the dropdown. It assigns the play field number to the pipeline, and then the reset play field function will handle the actual loading of the resource data. We'll see that function in a second. The Lenia play field resource defines the available properties for a play field. Things like the kernel size, the growth settings, and also the actual pixels for the starting pattern. The values here are the example defaults, but our life forms are stored in custom resources on the file system over here. Each one has the correct values assigned to make that life form or pattern work in the sim. You can even load these into the editor to see the actual details. Doing it this way makes the data much easier to work with when we go to load up the play field using a basic array of resource preloads. However, the custom resources were limited in two ways that I wasn't originally expecting. First, storing the patterns as large two-dimensional arrays inside a resource made them useless when viewing or editing them in the inspector. I resorted to opening the resource files outside of Godot to set the arrays with copy and paste. This was automatically reflected in Godot, so that was nice. The other issue came when I tried to store fractions for multi-ring kernels. In most datasets I found, the amplitudes were often represented in exact fraction formats, like 2 over 3 or 3 over 4. However, in the resources, they are always floats, and so we lose the specific fraction parts in some rare cases. So far, it hasn't caused problems, but I figured I'd mention it. In the backend script, we set up the variable for the playfield number, and we'll create a list of the lifeform resource files to preload. And here we finally get to the reset playfield function that does the work of choosing the correct index from our list of preloaded lifeforms, and then using that data to load the playfield in the configuration. The last thing to add is a quality of life feature. In the load playlist function, we'll add locking flags for different types of settings, so we can restart the sim or load a different playfield or kernels without erasing our current values. These checkboxes allow you to lock the playfield the kernel, and the configuration independently. We could enhance this further, but for now it serves its purpose. Like before, we don't need to make any further changes to the shader code to support this. All of the UI elements are handled in Godot, and we're just assigning values from the GD script. And when we put it all together, we get a nice simple interface where we can try different grids and growth settings. We can change and lock different parts of the sim, mix and match different types of kernels and settings, and adjust the smoothness to see different results in real time as they are applied to the shader. It's not perfect, but these controls give us more power over the sim without having to change the settings in code. And it could easily be improved if we want to refactor or add more features later on. Well, I found this to be a great project for the hobby coder, and I learned a lot along the way. From the compute shader itself, to using push constants, to using custom resources to store the famous patterns, this project covers several useful techniques that any Godot coder can use. So, what do you think? What would you add to this project? The full project and the open source code will be published to the Pathfinders Codex GitHub. You'll find our other projects there too, but if you want to get a sneak preview of upcoming projects, be sure to join the GitHub by sending us an email. If you found this interesting and want to see more videos and projects like this, be sure to subscribe. Your comments help keep us motivated and lets YouTube know our little channel exists, so please post your thoughts and ideas below. Until next time, thanks for watching the Pathfinders Codex.